you know, if you're an experimenter and you like yeah. to experience real world, then it, it, it's good. It's good. For, it's a bit frustrating when things start to really go bananas, like books fly off shelves and open and things like that. And that's not a that's not a pleasant place to be whatsoever. Ooh, wow! Wow! Synchronous is it? <laughs> Goodness me, James! What was that? Uh, was that young to live by? That's just fallen by, off yeah. your shelf. <laughs> Well, there you go. <laughs> just. A... I heard that. Was that the noise? You must... I knew that was going to happen. What? I felt something like that was going to happen. I had a kind of burning in my stomach. What are you talking about? It's the heating. The wood in the bookcase just cracked. That's all. No. It's what's known as a catalytic exteriorization phenomenon. A what? A catalytic exteriorization phenomenon. Don't be ridiculous. My diaphragm started to glow red hot. That's <laughs> And another thing. It's going to happen again. What? In a minute, it's going to happen again. My dear young friend, this is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. You must promise... You see? That's just... You really can't be serious. There are so many mysteries. So much further to go. Please, we can't be too careful. We can't afford to wander into these speculative areas. Telepathy, singing bookcases, fairies at the bottom of the garden. It won't do. It won't do. The, the, the psyche is a very strange, uh, very strange thing. Without wishing to... Um call forth the exteriorization phenomenon that Paul James has been uh, suffering from. Um, uh, <laughs> that was you speaking, wasn't it, James? Uh, <laughs> it's got a sense of humour. It's got a sense of humour. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I tell people I'm a materialist, and then they say, well, how come you believe in boo-boo? I say, no, I don't believe. If something happens, and there's sufficient evidence to say it really did, then it's real. And I don't know where matter begins and ends. And until somebody can define that, I'm not going to say something is supernatural. It's part of nature. I just don't understand it in a way that I can reduce to a standard scientific framework. But if it happens, I'm certainly going to accept it. And Jung had a similar idea. And in that sense, he reinforced my way of thinking about it. Uh, he had exteriorization phenomena, or at least reported that he did both at his house at Kuznak and over in Bollingen and Freud's house and, and other places. And over the years, it, it, there seems to be a process involved whereby, and the, the, I, I may have mentioned it on the Discord, and, and I'm sorry to repeat it if, mm. if people did read it there, but there seems to be a process like an escalator that, that goes down. And first of all, you get dissociation. That's the normal splitting of consciousness, the separation. Um, which is where complexes uh, are active. Then it goes a bit deeper than that, and then it starts to root through say, a Rossi pathway into the body. This is like the sublimation or suppression, transduction of a conflict, or whatever it may be. But it can't get much deeper than that, though, without it bouncing back out again, by metaphor, anyway. I'm not saying literally, physically, in a Newtonian mechanic sense, it bounces out, but it seems to happen in that way. And the thing that's decisive, it seems, on the basis of my own empirical experience, such as it is, is that when you have an unconscious conflict, the homeostasis can't solve, by which I mean the way that the unconscious normally regulates things, it can't solve the problem anymore. It tries to get the attention of the ego, and it does that by somaticizing. It'll turn up in the body. It just responded to you doing that, by the way, Steve. Had a big crash on the door, but I was uh, muted, so no one else. Nice to meet you again. Um, we've met before. Not always in, in, in you, James, of course, but in other people all the times. But dissociation is is the uh, the beginning of hysteria, if you think about it. In a, in a Breuer, Joseph Breuer, Sigmund Freud, studies on hysteria, the beginnings of psychotherapy as we know it today is dissociation, splitting, and hysteria. Then you'll get, like, a, uh, say, for example, uh, somebody has a frozen hand. It's quite common, you know, these things happen. Or a disturbance in vision or some other kind of thing like that. that that's at that level. That's pretty much at the psyche, even though it turns up in the body 
as a neurological symptom. Remember, Breuer was a neurologist. He was interested, as was Freud, he was interested in the neurological basis of these symptoms. Then they experienced how it ducks down into the body. They didn't understand the pathways what he does. Irritable bowel is an example, it's a common one, or others. If the homeostasis, the self-regulation, can't be solved at those levels, and the ego isn't dealing with it, it seems to be, seems, this is a working hypothesis that seems to match the observation, that when that happens, you get an exteriorization of the conflict. It's as if to say, the psyche says, I can't solve this. You have to, ego. Are you listening? I've tried dissociation, that hasn't worked. I've tried somatization, that hasn't worked. Time for you to meet it outside of yourself. Now, when, when you um, take, it's like, well, I jokingly call it Steve's first law. It's just a, there is just a joke, I'm not suggesting anything serious on that, but by his libido shall ye know him. You can apply that to an exteriorization phenomenon. By the libido of the person who produces it, you will understand the so-called poltergeist. Because the libido is instinctive. The instincts are in service ultimately of the genome and will certainly become empowered by repression and through conflict that is not resolved. So by his libido shall you know him. It's the same for hysterical uh, dissociation and it's the same for somaticization, any kind of symbolic conversion reaction. There is a libido behind it. That libido is instinctive. So the first uh, way of understanding it with a person who apparently manifests so-called poltergeist phenomena is what instincts, as per usual, what instincts are so frustrated they cannot express themselves any other way. The instinct is trying to solve a conundrum, but the unconscious can't do it. It's split, it's in the polarity. It's asked the ego, the ego won't do it. So therefore you have to see it outside of yourself. That is also the basis for projection and transference. That's seeing what's inside, outside. So it's an extension of that process too. But it seems to become physical in some sense. And when you uh, engage in a discussion, if you like, with a poltergeist, whether it's directly in person or by proxy as it is with James at this stage at any rate, although to be honest, when he's been round at our house, we've had weird things happen here. It's following James round, right? So this is James's poltergeist, it's nobody <laughs> else's. It's down to him to solve the riddle of his frustrated libido and the division that's deep within him. When he gets that, this will go away, it would have served its purpose. It's not malevolent, it's not a malevolent spirit. <clears throat> Shouldn't think of it in that way, it's a trickster. Now, tricksters have uh, a specific function. They always have had, that's why we have clowns and so forth. They're meant to deliver conflict that's not been resolved or earthed properly. That's why, uh, well, we have comedians. Comedians tell us what we're doing wrong. That, that's what, you know, memes do. Memes point out things that we're either not conscious of or insufficiently conscious of. It's always been the way. A poltergeist is a trickster phenomenon. An exteriorization phenomenon is a trickster. And it's trying to say, you're not solving this. I am the messenger. This is why we say they're mercurial or hermetic. Hermes and Mercury, essentially the same god, the messenger of the gods, is a trickster, is mercurial. You know? So that, that's what we, what we get. So if you kind of go along with it, you're not going to have too many problems. If you're going to treat, if you treat the poltergeist with some respect and intentionality towards its purpose, you will reduce the threat. However, what it will try to do, it will try to provoke a fear reaction in you. Why would that be? Well, from the, from the point of view of the poltergeist, you're looking to access instinct. Fear is one of the fundamental emotions, basic panxepian instincts. If you're in a fear state, that should tell you this is deep, this is right down in me, this has to do with something really, really fundamental. But the fear shouldn't be too high. If it's too high, you won't learn anything from it. So it's an arousal state that draws you by your attention to the fact that this is important. How you handle it right now in that state when you realize what the fear is, is really important because you have a choice. You have a choice of making it a superstition. If you, 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 you turn it into a superstitious reaction and say it's a ghost or something like that, then you will pull towards that auto suggestion, everything that's in your autobiographical memory and learning, all your complexes, that has to do with 
superstition, religion, magical thinking, whatever. You, you've then just stopped yourself from experiencing it. If you relax as much as you possibly can, bearing in mind you may have had an, an automatic fear reaction to, to this thing, all oh, right, so I'm meant to take hold and notice of my instincts. At that point, you'll probably find you get a reaction from the poltergeist. And then you have your communication channel. That's what you want. If you have communication, you can solve it. If you don't, you won't. So that, mm. that's the subtlety of it. Don't run into superstition. Keep your ego strength. That's yeah. critical of you as a clinician as well, isn't yes, it, really? Yeah, absolutely. Because obviously people will, will come into you mm. in a fear state, as you might be saying, Steve, they've got, um, you know, their sort of autobiographical uh, memory uh, feeding in to that fear as well. And you, you can't afford to be wobbled by it yourself. So no. um, it, it is, you do have to have the ego strength. To know yes. how to approach it and i think as you say if you if you deconstruct it and you strip it of, of uh, all the superstition and, and maybe the religious connotations and so on you can actually start to get somewhere with it but we do get we do get people coming into us clinically oh, yes. who are in a heck of a state yes. and um, it's one of those challenging things really particularly if you've you've had a very religious upbringing and you you know even if you, you've moved away from that or you believe you've moved away from it sometimes these things do stir yes so, okay. just 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 to let everyone know it's currently banging on the office uh, currently banging on the office door the response to you guys yeah so that, that's part of it because it's it's time to come and shift which it comes on every night around this time or it's actually interacting with the informational field that we're generating between us all mm. right now um i suggested to james the other night Somebody mentioned Chevro's Pendulum before. I think it might have been Zach. Was it? Was it Zach who mentioned Chevro's Pendulum? Somebody did. Zach or Dean? It might have been Dean, mightn't it? I suggested that um, James use a Chevro's Pendulum kind of channel of communication because, again, it's an unconscious phenomenon. And if it's sing signaling through banging or moving up and down stairs or writing things on mirrors and putting up palm prints, as has been happening, amongst other things, then the channel of communication is open for you to interact with and then to use a kind of 20 questions protocol to resolve down and, and see what kind of answers you get. Bearing in mind, it's hermetic. So it will be playing a little joke on you every now and again just to keep itself interested. Uh, in that sense, though, keep your ego boundary, but be polite. It will respect you if you do. If you, if you give in and if you crash, Imagine giving in to a practical joker. They'll ramp it up in order to try and get a response out of you. You know, the, the, this is it. This is how to draw on cultural, I'll call them stereotypes rather than archetypes, about what is a practical joker? What do they get out of it? Mm. You know, and then that's what you're dealing with. But fundamentally with James, this is something from his past, uh, which he is separated from. Mark Soles would say it's probably an automatized memory or series of automatized memories, which he can't access again directly. He's separated from the affect, in other words. Uh, and Mark would suggest in typical uh, psychoanalytic terms that he should just continually work on this uh, by studying the transference onto the therapist because eventually it's projected out onto the therapist. This is one of the things that sustains psychoanalytic therapy mm -hmm. for as long as it goes on for. You don't need to do that. that that's an artifact of the way that the Freudian approach has developed. The most essential thing is, is communication. So Chevro's pendulum, as we know, <clears throat> is caused by your own unconscious mind. And when we physically train therapists, for example, um, we get them to experience Ouija boards and things like that. So they understand what's really doing it. it it's As Carl Jung correctly identified over 120 years ago, it's, it's an idiomotor phenomenon. Um, and once you identify that, then it stops. It stops working. It's like this with a lot of occult things. But a poltergeist-like phenomenon, for want of a better term, is different. This is something which is independent of your physical action, whereas, say, a Ouija board where you put your, you know, several people with their fingers on a glass, it's a summation of the idiomotor uh, movements that starts the thing off. So that's at a lower level of registry or common. This is less common, but it is real. Behind it though, there are psychodynamics, not spirits. It's so important to understand that. 
you're working with your own unconscious communication and respect of everything so uh, treat it with respect expect it to have a bit of a, a laugh at your expense because that's what they do but its intentionality is to get you to solve the problem it's on your side just paradoxically it appears to be playing with you a bit the difficulty for James will be if I can talk about him in this way, uh, as if he's not here. Well, he isn't, is he? Is he? Lost him. Oh, is he gone? Oh, oh, well, there we go. <laughs> no, I am still here, Pauline. Are you there, James? Still, Where yeah. are you? Can't see you on the screen. <laughs> because he's live rather than. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah. Oh, look at that. You've moved. Did That's you hear that? Did. Or did you not hear I did hear it. I did, I did hear oh, it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, uh, our, our friend is live as well. Yeah, well, fair enough. It was. So it, it varies in where it is in the house. Sometimes it's on this door. Sometimes. Yes, it's moving around, isn't it? So uh, treat it with respect. I mean, I, I said last night to James, um, does it want me to come round to the house? And then there was a cacophony of noise, apparently. Um, now, I'm taking that as a transference and not from James consciously. I'm taking that as part of the action of the poltergeist to involve me in trying to create a, a triangulation, if you like, between his unconscious me and it. So I ask him the question he's not asking himself. So I said, I'm not, I won't do it because James has to answer it. Because if I answer it for him directly, it's still transference. And something happened then, James? Can you hear that? Can anyone else hear that? Just, if you just knock on the door in response to what you just said. Right. Well, I'm, I'm sure it understands it's, it's overstanding there uh, on the other side of the door, James. <laughs> but, um, it's necessary for you to understand this. It's part of you. And if I, if I agree to turn up the in person, that will allow you to project it onto me. And I don't mean the poltergeist. I, I'm, I don't feel threatened by that. What I wouldn't want to happen would be for you to not solve it, but it to be carried through as transference. And I honestly think that that's probably at the root of the whole thing. It's an early relationship to a family member or members whereby you dissociated in order to protect yourself from something. And as a result of that, you developed into the person you are, which is a, a wonderful person with such high potential and talent. Fuck you now. You're all right. <laughs> you're all right, my friend? Did you hear that? Uh, I was busy talking. I probably didn't. And again, this is fucked. Anyway, to, to continue, um, a person of such high potential and talent, but narrower than you, you, than you could be. Yeah. Are you all right there, James? Yeah, I'm fine. There is, there is a song, isn't there? Not Three Times on the Ceiling, remember that? By, by Dawn. Dawn, yeah. The Dawn of a New Day. James, are you okay? He's looking rather... He's gesturing. Something. There's like yeah. wind coming from that room. Just a... <sighs> yeah. I, I heard that. Was that the noise? That was loud. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Carry on, Steve. Sorry. No problem. No problem. So, yeah. If I were to turn off, then it would try to get me to tell you what it is. Well, I want you to tell yourself. And it's tried to get you to tell yourself, and it hasn't worked. And that's why it's frustrated, if you like. I say, yes, it's really you. That's your frustration. I don't want to um, comply, if you like, with the transference. I want you to solve this. It's going to take an effort of will. It really is. But you do have the strength and you have great courage. I mean, you've, you've put with so much that would break so many people. It's admirable. And I do know you're nowhere near what you can become. But you have to, be, you have to, to win. You have to beat this repression and this dissociation. Mm. That's your task. That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> 
I really hope that was on camera. And I hope everyone else heard that. That was insanity. There, there was there was some noise. There was, yeah. Some of it I could hear and some of it I could mm. like there it wasn't just dumb. It was a gush of wind sound coming from there. Mm. Not from there, from here. Like under the door, it was almost like yeah, Dean hears wind as well. Yeah, I, I heard wind uh, during that. It's like a like a, like you get in like a movie, yeah. not normal. So uh, thanks, Steve. It, it, obviously, we knew it would respond to you. We... <laughs> if you think hey, if you think about it, it's transference. You see, I don't I don't want this uh, <clears throat> I don't want this nonsense to derail the uh, the education of Carter too, Steve. So if you want to carry on, carry on. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it, it is in context, it's isn't in a, it? Yeah. It, it? It's in a lot of context because... It's in and of itself, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's real. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just shows how deep transference dynamics can go. And, and also, hopefully, to encourage people not to be afraid yeah, of, of helping other people yeah. who have this yeah. or, or a similar issue. If you're looking to take your study of depth psychology and personal development to the next level using Steve and Pauline's 40 year long clinical experience as your personal guide, then make sure you check out Young to Live By's flagship offering, Discover Your Personal Myth Ultimate Handbook. For anyone who has a calling deep in their very genome to become who they truly feel they should be, this guide is utterly indispensable. Pick up your copy today and make 2021 the year you truly begin to become yourself.